without further ado, uh, Derek, <coughs> Gynostema, the immortal being, and the immortal beings. <laughs> no, thank you. Thanks All very right. much. Pretty great. Thank you. It's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>
is a vigorous, actually this is gonna stem here, forgot to mention. These are some cuttings of the plant downstairs. Just gonna make yeah, sure. Which is amazing, it's beautiful. So it's a perennial vine. So you can see the herb here, if I can show one. You probably won't be able to see this at the back, but there's fine little tendrils, right? It's a climbing vine. It's actually very robust and very aggressive how it grows. We can grow it here, but it needs to be in a greenhouse if it's outdoors. Um, excuse me, it can't survive the cold weather. But from all my research, it doesn't necessarily need a tropical environment. It doesn't need like that hot, high humidity, even though that might be somewhat ideal. Um, the Ganastema that we have is grown in northern Thailand, Chiang Mai area. So you're getting less humidity, higher elevation is a big bonus. So if you do have a greenhouse here with our higher elevation, um, could and should grow fantastic. I think your plant downstairs is doing pretty good. Yeah, so. Uh, is it the leaves that are used? <coughs> the leaves and a little bits of the stem. And I'll talk about that because this is, so basically the tea culture, so if you, and if you want to learn more about tea in general, um, you got to check out the fermentation festival this coming next weekend. I'm going to do a whole presentation on tea and brewing tea for kombucha, which is pretty exciting. So tea is like this huge other area. Um, it is the most consumed herb in the world by people. Uh, tea has its own culture, own things. In the southern mountainous region of China, this little area, this was their green tea if that makes sense. So the processing, especially for the Ganestema, and I could even pass this around while I'm talking. This is some Ganestema here. This is actually cured and processed similar to what a green or black tea would be. So picked, dried, it's a little bit of a secret process, but then rolled. So you'll see it's hand rolled, or sorry, it's not hand rolled, it's a machine, but they do it by hand. Um, but getting back, so it's this perennial vine that grows really aggressive, really robustly. It does have the, uh, fear of being an invasive species it's that aggressive so shows you what kind of chi what kind of vigor this plant is pr um, giving to the human body but it actually is a member of the cucumber family so it's one of the members of this family the curcubidaceae family um, that doesn't produce the typical fruit from this family the cucumber family so Ganestema now in China, it has been virtually used, and we're talking in the areas that Ganestema was used, again, so I explained about the Chinese medicine was kind of evolving a little bit different, but it was used as, and still is, as a virtual cure-all. Now there's very, very few things that I've ever come across that I would believe are somewhat of a cure-all. Um, I know medicinal mushrooms get that kind of stamp a lot of the times. I, I am a huge fan, if you know me at all, about uh, medicinal mushrooms. A big fungi right here. I was just joking, but um, even medicinal mushrooms, I don't use the term a cure-all. They're a great, great thing to add to your diet, you know, for your, your herbal approach. But when it comes to gynostema, it's doing a lot of similarities as medicinal mushrooms, but even more. So even more. We'll get into why that is. So it's said to first be discovered in 2000 AD. So this is past the time period of the famous... Um, tonic herbalist, uh, father of Chinese medicine, Shen Nong. So this is one of these rare herbs that he actually didn't discover or wasn't in the original text that he created. It then went, so two, the year 200 discovered um, by an empress, Fo Shu. So she discovered this. I'm thinking maybe that's why it didn't get the popularity right away because it wasn't a, a male thing. Right in that time, there was big disparity between the genders. Uh, it then officially appeared in the 13th century in meditation texts. So it has roots in Buddhist uh, religion, Buddhist meditation, uh, Buddhist healing. So, and I found this fascinating. So I'm gonna get in obviously the benefits of Ganestema, but they were relying it solely for the mind enhancing properties. And we'll learn about how it's super protective for the mind and also the nervous system, how it can regulate the two. Now by the 16th century, it started to show up in a variety of holistic texts through China. But again, because it didn't have that firm rooting in the evolution of traditional Chinese medicine, it still wasn't given the respect it deserves. Everyone's with me on that? Now there's a couple different stories on how Ganestema really blew up. Um, a lot of people say oh, it was the Japanese studying this, or no, it was the Chinese that did this. Uh, from, my, whoops, from my research, I like to believe the story that Japanese researchers were actually trying to find a sugar alternative. This is in the 70s. So they were researching and um, studying things like stevia. Everyone's probably familiar with stevia. Uh, Ganestema was one of them. So Jiao Gulan was one of these herbs they were looking at. When they started to look at the research behind it, 
they started to say, well, how are these people traditionally using it? So traditionally in this area, even though it was a cure-all, it was heavily, heavily relied upon as a lung remedy. Now, it brings me to one of my other points about why I want to talk about this today at this time of year. Because if you come to any of my seasonal eating classes or follow like a Chinese medicine eating approach, we know we're now in the season of fall. Even though it feels like winter, right? It feels like winter out there a little bit. We're in the season of fall, which relates to the organs of the lungs. So this is lung season in traditional Chinese medicine. So any sort of lung tonic or lung supportive herb at this time of year is going to be paramount in your specific herbal strategy. Does that make sense? We want to embrace lung herbs um, at this time of year. So they started seeing, hey, how are people using it? So they're using it as a lung tonic. That's interesting. So they started to do a little bit of research on it and they found that it was massively effective in chronic bronchitis and all these other areas and started to find, you know, and I won't get too deep into it, but different avenues of this herb this one Japanese researcher kind of took that and ran with it. Long story short, obviously, and there's some back and forth on this. Started to do a ton of research on it and find these amazing properties of gynostema. He eventually passed away and it halted basically all the advancements he'd made by popularizing gynostema. Well, during the 70s as well, the Chinese government start, did a, a demographic or a population census. And they found that this area in the southern region of China, mountainous southern region, was an area where it had a very, very rich amount of centurions, right? People living to 100 and over. So they started researching on why this is, right? And they started looking, okay, first thing to look at is lifestyle and diet, right? Well, immediately they found a similarity that spanned all these people that were living to over 100, <coughs> plus the people in that area had lower amounts of disease, lower amounts of cancer. They had better overall health than all of China. The one thing they had in common is they were all drinking gynostema. So now fast forward, the Chinese government took this and they're like, oh, this is crazy. What's going on here? They found out gynostema. They saw some, some preliminary research already done on it by the Japanese and it just kind of exploded. So I actually do believe, even though I think there's a lot of accounts out there where the Japanese... Um, did all the research behind gynostema. From my research, that's not what I have found. If everyone's with me. And it doesn't really matter. In the end of the day, we're left with a ton of interesting info. <coughs> so not to get too far into the energetics of gynostema, but when we look at it, it's something called a three treasure tonic herb. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with the three treasures. A little bit. Some people. So if you're not, so the three treasures are basically three fundamental energies on how the body interacts with each other. Sorry, excuse me, the organs, how they interact in the body with each other. So we have the Jing, we have the Qi, and we have the Shen. So these are very important three treasures. Suffice to say that Ganesama is a three treasure tonic. It's specifically good at the Qi aspect, which again, if we look at seasonal eating approach or Chinese medicine, the season of the fall is the lung season, but it's also the season of the Qi. Our lungs are what we breathe, right? The, the energy from the air, it, excuse me, it emanates that electricity through the body. So when we drink gynostema, we're getting a chi flow in the body. We're opening up those chi channels. Same reason why you'd go to acupuncture, right? Opening up those meridian points, we're getting that flow of chi in the body, very important. So we see that it deals with also, besides the three treasures, all five major organs, the heart, the liver, the stung, stomach, excuse me, the lung and the kidneys also enhances the mind. We'll get into a lot of it. Um, there's two major anti-aging actions of gynostema, which I'm going to maybe save as we're going forward. But what I will say is there's something called superoxide dismutase. Anyone familiar with SOD? Yeah, a few people. So it's a main antioxidant that your body actually secretes. It supersedes any sort of plant antioxidant and its ability to scavenge for free radicals. Basically, aging is very intertwined to your production of SOD. And as we age, we decline in our SOD production. So we want things that will induce superoxide dismutase in the body, something that's going to scavenge these superoxide molecules. We find that gynostema induces this effect. Now, you can't take SOD as a supplement, even though you can buy SOD as a supplement. And there may be some nuances that I'm unfamiliar with now, but basically it doesn't translate into an oral, or, or sorry, an oral um, supplement doesn't translate into the body well. It's usually destroyed in the stomach. So we want to consume these, these herbs that get that natural production going. 
Fast forward to the other anti-aging action is it also regulates something called uh, NF kappa B or nuclear factor kappa B. Is anyone familiar with that? NF kappa B? So NF kappa B is like our main anti-inflammatory, excuse me, our main inflammatory switch in the body, right? It can be either on or off. Now, inflammation is always like we want to be anti-inflammatory all the time. We need parts of inflammatory processes, right? That's how we fight disease. That's how we heal the body. We just want a nice regulation. And that's where autoimmune comes in when the one side is too out of hand attacking your own cells. Everyone kind of with me? We don't have a lot of time to get into it, but that's basically, so we got the superoxide dismutase and the NF kappa B regulation. So already we're starting to see a little bit of the magic behind gynostema. <coughs> Now, when I was saying that gynostema is a chi tonic, which it is, the very interesting thing and one of the most important aspects I can talk about today and portray or, or sorry, pass on about gynostema is that it has this dual directional activity. So when we look at how it was traditionally used as a lung tonic, yes, as a green kind of tea daily drinker, yes, but they knew years and thousands of years ago that if we we can drink on a stem in the morning and it's going to wake us up. It's not going to stimulate the body. It's going to enhance that chi flow. So it's very, I don't want to say alerting to the body, but it definitely gives an, a slight energizing effect. It'll bring you awake. It'll turn you on. It'll give you a harmony in your thoughts and your activities for the day. The very interesting thing is it also can be drank at night before bed. So it's got this dual directional activity where it knows, hey, the nervous system needs to be woken up. Let's get the party started. Or hey, the party's over, let's wind it down, right? So if the, the, the central nervous system is depressed, up. If it's overexcited, it's gonna calm it down. This can also translate really well into 2018 where a lot of people wake up in the morning have tons of anxiety about the day. I'm sure a lot of people here do. Um, it's kind of become a crazy phenomenon. I've noticed more and more anxiety, right, in the morning. That's the adrenal kind of time of, of the morning. But anyway, besides that point, um, gynostem is going to know whether you need that wake up or that calm, calmness, right? So you can drink it any time of day. And if I don't say this now, or if I forget to before, I'll say it now, excuse me, is that gynostem can be drank by young, old, anywhere in between. It's extremely safe, extremely safe herb. So it was known as this rejuvenating elixir, right? And it's so interesting that the emperors since the beginning of time you know, we're always sending ships overseas and traveling to find the elixir of life. They now in like the 1980s kind of proclaim like, hey, we found the elixir of life. And ironically, it was right here at our doorstep. It was right in our country. So it not only, and I, I can't remember if I said this, but not only grows in China, but you'll find it, there's actually 30 different varieties of gynostema, uh, but you'll find it grow in obviously China, Thailand, Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, I believe one variety grows in Korea. So you will find that it's kind of spread out. And in Calgary, yeah, Calgary, Alberta. So we don't, this is the classic thing and I'm trying to actually give you a lot of info today that you won't find so easily on the internet. The big thing when you look up gynostema is you always see that it's relationship to ginseng. Everyone's probably familiar with ginseng. It's like the most famous tonic herb um, on the planet. So ginseng's known as this really powerful, amazing adaptogen for the body. Uh, it's got all this interesting activity. Well, gynostem and ginseng share a lot of the similar chemistry. So it gets into something called saponins, which we don't have a lot of time in this slide to get into, but we will get into. Actually, it might be the next. No, it's coming up. But these saponins are what give this adaptogenic function to gynostema and ginseng. We find that they found about 28 different saponins in ginseng to give it this magic. They now have found over 120 in gynostema. So gynostema was always known as like ginseng, but better than ginseng. One of the common names, just finish my thought and I'll get to your question. One of the common names for gynostema was poor man's ginseng. The reason I didn't put that on the front slide and I don't use that is because there's actually several in China use that um, same kind of common name. One more famous one with this name is called Codenopsis. So that's why, but you will see in the internet always relationship with uh, ginseng. Question? Um, just the 128 what? Uh, saponins. Saponins? Yeah, we'll get into what that is. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And I'll show you when we brew it because you can see, gynostem is amazing this way, is you can see the saponins when you're brewing, brewing, excuse me, the tea up, which we'll get to. Is that what you do with that bitter taste that you brew? <coughs> Ken? Yeah, Ken, and there's also some sweet molecules in there. So out of these 120, they found... 
um, up to 17 that are very similar to ginseng, four that are actually identical, and then there's another 11 that again are, are starting to be discovered that, hey, these are very similar, but there's whatever you, you can do the math um, at home in your spare time on this, but the, um, the other ones aren't fully identified yet. They just know that it belongs to this glycoside group that we find in gynostema. So we find people saying like ginseng, but better gin than ginseng, but the traditionalists knew that gynostema was so much broader act uh, acting, excuse me, and so much better for people that were sensitive to ginseng. So this is a great example of how gynostema supersedes a lot of even, even adaptogens. So ginseng is an amazing adaptogen. Um, I use ginseng, I love it, but it's not for everybody, even though it's a gentle tonic herb. We find that gynostema is still more gentle than ginseng. Can, can help more people, right? So now this is actually kind of what your uh, question was talking about too, Donna. So the saponins, but there's this combination of compounds found in gynostema that again, they don't fully understand with the sweet and the bitter going on. But this is where we get into, well, why don't we just make an extract of these compounds and we can take them as a pharmaceutical? And they do do that somewhat, but there's, they've found um, some differences where the whole herb in this case is actually performed better than extracts. And I say that too because the extracts of gynostema can be very pricey, taking capsules of it. You're better off taking whole tea and just drinking it. So we find these compounds do crazy things like they e stop and even reverse something called telomere erosion. So is everyone familiar? Is people familiar with telomeres? Right there, if you're not familiar, they're end caps on our DNA. So if you think of the, the double helix spiral, there's these end caps on there that are holding that DNA in place. And as we age, these telomeres, and due to stress and toxins, these telomeres start to erode, and they let that DNA unspiral. Have you ever seen like a sci-fi movie when they go inside the guy or whatever, when he starts to die, they show his DNA kind of unspiraling and disappearing? That's what happens to us as we age. Our DNA starts to unspiral. When we lose the integrity of our DNA, right, our cell structure just starts to disintegrate, party's over. That makes sense? So we want to help keep these telomeres anchored. We want to keep this DNA in place. And ideally and amazingly, we want to reverse it. And I don't know anything other than possibly an extract of astragalus that does this process. And that extract of astragalus called TA65, I think it's called, is like thousands of dollars. Well, gynostema is starting to be found to be better than that even, right? So we want to drink this on a daily basis to keep our telomeres in place. Everyone with me so far? Yeah, let me just check on time. Okay. Is we're with the telomeres? Uh, it's not fully understood, but it's the more the saponins, not necessarily the telomere activity. Yeah. So gynostema, this is, uh, is relevant, but also a little side note, is a very, very nutritive herb. So we find amino acids, we find vitamins, we find minerals like selenium, magnesium, zinc, calcium, iron, potassium, manganese, uh, even phosphorus in gynostema. I also mention this too, and if I forget to say this when I'm brewing it, if you leave gynostema leaves out like in your strainer for like more than a day, it will go funky really fast. It's because it's so nutritive right? Things just love it. So it's different than like your chaga, which you could brew up and leave out for like days and rebrew it. Like pretty much, you know, as long as it's open air, like common sense prevails here, but open air, your chaga will be good. Um, Gynostema is antimicrobial, but it's so nutritive that things will just get on it and it'll be funky. <laughs> and I don't mean the 70s funk, I mean real funk. So we also find something called polysaccharides in gynostema. So if you're familiar with medicinal mushrooms, these are immune foods, basically compounds, that feed the immune system that we'll find in medicinal mushrooms are also in gynostema. Now getting to the meat of the potato, also rich in saponins. Now like I said before, it's these saponins which are termed japenicides. So we find saponins and classes of, of chemistry will be named after, excuse me, after herbs that um, they're found in like in ginseng, they're called jacinicides. Gynostema, they're called japenicides. But basically, they're saponins. So I'll get more into the chemistry behind saponins coming up here. Um, but basically, it's these saponins that give gynostema this hugely wide activity of use when it comes to its adaptogenic effect. Now, this wide array is super interesting. So we find that when you talk about um, adaptogens, 
we find that commonly adaptogens will, will have a lot of different benefits. So actually right here, you can read this for yourself, but an adaptogen, if you're not familiar with, I'll back up a little bit, is categorized by an herb that helps the body adapt to internal and external stressors, right? That's the common definition. But while helping enhance the health of an individual by regulating or supporting bodily functions, right? It has to have this effect where it brings us back to homeostasis. So getting to my point on a lot of adaptogens, we'll find that they'll have a wide activity of use, but they usually only have one or two primary areas that they're good and a ton of secondary tertiary benefits. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? If we look at herbs like uh, rhodiola, for example, we find rhodiola is great for you know adrenals and energy. It also will help your blood sugar, but it's not what I would recommend first off for blood sugar. Does that kind of make sense? Right? It's all these other benefits. So great healthy herbs to get the diet. Ganostema has this wide activity of use rate and has it's it excels at all these areas where it doesn't really have secondary and tertiary benefits. There's actually over 300 published studies on gynostema, which is amazing. And when you actually start looking, you're like, wow, there's 300 studies, yet we hardly have heard about this herb or know about it. We find that 50 of these studies, Brent, did I turn this off or is it still on? We're good. I think. We're good? We're good. Check, check. Okay. Um, 300, there's 50 of these studies are actually done on humans and I think animals, but for sure human studies, which is another huge benefit, right? When you actually have human studies behind an herb. So there's a rich array of published studies done on gynostema to show its effectiveness. <coughs> so as, as I was saying before, come on in. As I was saying before, gynostema is an adaptogen with this double directional activity, and that's where it shines to give everything that it does this primary use, this primary function. Um, what you also see the term biphasic use when we talk about dual directional. So biphasic is basically the same thing. We find this biphasic activity of the nervous system of all these modulating effects. So for sake of time too, I'm going to go a little bit quicker maybe through this. Um, but it's all about how gynostema normalizes and maintains the integrity of your system very, very effectively. And again, I can't stress this enough is, you know, even myself, like researching gynostema and then researching it again lately for this talk today, just blown away by all this research that is a little bit older and all this new stuff that's coming more relevantly out or, or more contemporarily out, if that makes sense, um, on gynostema that you're just like, wow, this does this, does that. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. Now, the, the thing about gynostema, and again, this is something I'd like to stress to everybody and, and really put it in your mind, especially when I talk about any tonic herbs, is its consistency of use that's so important, right? It's about that constant consumption. It doesn't mean that you need to go home and drink gallons of gynostema that, hey, I'm going to turn into Superman because I'm going to down all this tea right away. It's about, hey, let, let's take it easy in that gradual approach. That constant approach is what's going to be the magic um, behind these, these adaptogens and tonic herbs. Is everyone with me on that? In China, like I said, they drink one or two cups in the morning, maybe one or two cups in the evening. I'm going to talk about more specific dosages for therapeutic amounts and daily amounts. But really, you don't need to overthink it with amounts. It's more just about, hey, getting it in your diet. And again, I'm going to show you uh, one recipe and a couple different ways that you can consume gynostema tea. So now, I just want to show a little bit about the chemistry. So we talked about these saponins, right? So saponins are the magic chemistry, or, or at least one of the magic chemistry groups that we know of in gynostema. So a saponin is called a japenicide when it's in gynostema, right? Everybody's got that, japenicide. Now, these japenicides are saponin group, which means they have an alglycone excuse me, and a, a sugar attached to it. So a non-sugar part and a sugar part attached to it, right? To make this glycoside molecule. Now we find that the saponins in gynostema belong to the Damarane framework group. So what is that, Damarane framework? We see that these saponins actually have a very similar chemical structure to our body's hormones and other, new, uh, other aspects of the body like bile acid. So this is testosterone, this is bile acid, this is the Damarane framework, the basis, before the sugar molecule gets attached to make it a japenicide. This is very important. What this means is this, these opponents can have a steroidal activity in the body. 
So first, when we think steroidal activity, we think, oh, we're giving our body hormones, right? We think a hormone this um, is going to adjust it. Oh, I'm low in this. Let's take it. We find the saponins, especially the Damarain framework, these specific steroidal-like compounds do not give the body hormones. They mimic hormones only for the fact to help your body induce your natural production of hormones. So they're like putting like a... What's the right analogy here? Not gas in a gas tank, but like a igniter to a fire, right? It's going to just explode that and get that fire going. Same kind of idea here. When we're consuming these saponins, we're getting our natural production of hormones back into homeostasis, back into those levels that we want it to be in. Something interesting, and I will talk about this on the next slide, but we actually, one of the things, I think it's on the next slide, so if it's not, I'll say it now. Um, Gunnastema, this bile acid, how it looks so similar to bile acid, we actually find that, so getting ahead a bit, how there's a, a cholesterol adjusting effect with gynostema, like a very effective cholesterol balancing modulation effect. We find that this, this Damarain framework will actually, this one of these saponins, everyone's good? Uh, one of these saponins in there will actually bind to bad cholesterol or dirty bile and pull it out of the body better than psyllium. So I'm familiar with psyllium husk, right? You use it to like soak a bad bile in the body to get your cholesterol down, to detoxify. Gynostem is actually more effective than psyllium at binding to this dirty bile to bring it out of the system. Like that's huge, in my opinion. Although I'm a nerd, so. <laughs> so getting to again to the meat of the potato, what can gynostema do for you? I could have went on and on and on and on about this, gone point after point easily could have hit 25 points. This is 16 points. Again, there's a lot of, of info out there, um, but these are some of the main ones. So antioxidant. So these, again, are the therapeutic qualities. When I was talking about the wide activity of use and how gynostem is good at every one of these areas, none of these are secondary benefits. It's good at all of this. So again, uh, inducing SOD, superoxide dismutase, that antioxidant protecting effect, super powerful. Adaptation to stresses, right? That main adaptogenic effect by the saponins. Enhancing cardiovascular function, enhancing circulation. What it does is it actually makes the heart work better, pump more blood while taking less strain off the heart. It makes your, it's like getting your car fine-tuned. It makes it work more efficiently. We see this in herbs like red Chinese dates and elk antler. They do the same, where they'll make the heart pump more fully and better, but more in a relaxed state. This is what it's all about. Gynostema does this very effectively. So it helps reduce the resting heart rate if you need to, right? It's always going to modulate that um, while getting more blood flow, enhancing that chi, that circulation throughout the body. Pretty impressive. Regulates blood pressure. So a lot of herbs will drop your blood pressure or some can raise it. It's going to modulate. I forget the percentage stat on it, but it's very, very effective. And I think it can reduce it by... It can modulate, excuse me, close to the blood sugar, like a 30%. It's like a massive benefit. Um, regulate cholesterol. I talked a little bit about that bile absorbing or, or binding capacity. We find that reducing cholesterol ranges into an 86 to a 97% effective rating. Like that's huge because there's always people out there that have tried to get their cholesterol down. Um, if you're one of those people, you might want to give gynostem a try. I'm just going to keep my eye on this because it's going to boil any second here. Uh, prevent heart attack or stroke. It is amazing at helping the blood stay the perfect thinness, right? It's going to help with that platelet aggregation and remove plaque buildup. These saponins, and one of the biggest things I always talk about, it's easier to explain to people, these saponins are soap-like molecules, okay? So when I brew this tea up, I'm going to show you how it's going to foam on top because these are soap-like molecules that will actually dissolve in water and oil, so they'll emulsify. So when you're drinking gynostema, and again, this is the easiest way to explain it to people, you're literally washing the body from the inside out. You're washing arteries clean. You're washing fatty deposits clean. This is very, very important and very beneficial and very profound. Profound for the body. Uh, we see white blood cell formation, strengthen immunity. There's all sorts of research on how it helps the spleen produce new cells. Uh, regulates blood sugar up to 35% modulation in your blood sugar, up or down. Pretty powerful. Also, there's a huge, and this is kind of a newer thing with gynostema, on how it, it really uh, takes the strain off the pancreas for insulin secretion, helps repair the pancreas. Right? If we know Chinese medicine, sweet herbs help the spleen, stomach. What they're talking about is the pancreas a lot of the time. So we see that 
that insulin-like activity helping with sensitivity and also removing resistance to insulin. And if you know anything about aging, that's a huge, huge benefit. We see cancer inhibition in cells and tumor formation. There was even some more recent research I found on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, tumors in the colon as well, right? They thought other cells in the body. And again, a lot of this has been done on humans. There's 250 in vitro studies, so that's cells. A lot of the cancer ones were done on cells, but still there is some overlap into human studies, which is pretty profound. And the, the colorectal cancer was one. Now we see an anti-senility effect, so a protective effect for the mind. Right, it's going to protect, and this is what they knew in China, that energizing, rejuvenating elixir, calm the nervous system, but switch on the mind capacity. Hugely important. Now, as we all age, especially like in this province with high amounts of dementia and Alzheimer's, I, I suggest any sort of anti-senility agent you can get, you should be taking at any age. It's just one of these kind of 2018 phenomena. We talked about the anti-aging, stopping and reversing telomere degradation. I think she's got my phone, so I'll just check the time. Someone can keep me on track? On the wall. On the wall. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Because um, I think you got my phone. <laughs> That's okay. I'll just use it. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Okay, 1148. Um, uh, liver protective supports and stimulates liver function, which is hugely important. Again, overall aging, overall detoxification capacity of the body. Uh, we see that nervous system protective nature. I already talked about this. The support is protecting the nervous system. So good for uh, neuralgia or neuropathy. Really good for those. We see that it regulates nit nitric oxide production. So if you ever read about gynostema, and again, like I said, the list can go on and on for the amazing benefits. It'll actually help regulate sex function as well. Uh, so it helps with erectile dysfunction in men. That's nitric oxide to help that blood flow in that area. Also, how that can translate into women <coughs> is menopause and PMS symptoms. Very effective. Uh, the Latin name gynostema, which I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but does deal with um, the female aspect of the herb. It's really important. Um, nitric oxide production as well is really important when you get, when you, when you talk about depression or like senility, all these things, but especially when depression, um, low in neurotransmitters, like things like GABA, because I don't know if you're aware, but a lot of those neurotransmitters are actually produced in the gut, and they need to cross the blood-brain barrier, right? This is like our emotional brain, right, our intestines. They rely on nitric oxide production to open and vasodilate those, those uh, our, uh, capillaries, excuse me, to get into the brain. So when we talk about depression, gynostema can be a real mood enhancer. So if you remember me talking about a three-treasure tonic, Shen is one of those treasures. Shen is our personality, so it's going to make you lighter, more happier. And it is noticeable with gynostema. That's why I joke around all the time. Just kidding. <laughs> um, talked about the blood platelets, uh, getting rid of the plaque. And I talked about the fatty deposits emulsifying all those fatty buildups in the body. Right? It's going to wash. Now, the other side of that, dissolving fatty deposits, is gynostema also helps with digestion. So we see that it supports the liver. It's also got a similarity to bile acid, right? Also very, very effective. This is one of the ways I'll use it with uh, younger people or older too, but um, it's very effective at elimination or helping elimination. So these soap-like molecules, which now I'm gonna brew so I can show you guys. These soap-like molecules are dissolving. They're also lubricating. So gynostema is amazing for like, I, I don't wanna say serious bouts of constipation, even though it definitely can help, but any sort of minor backup, gynostema is your ticket. Super easy and super effective. Things are just going to be falling out of you like crazy. So and who doesn't want that when you're backed up, right? It's going to open those gates. Very, very effective. Very easy to get in because it's such sweet, nice and bitter. Drink it any time of the day. No problems. Very effective for that. So was there any questions on this? Kind of skipping ahead pretty quick, but I want to make sure that we get to see the opponents. We brew some tea. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah? And then we can go questions on my cleanup after if you have any. So what I'm going to do, so like I said before, Ganastema, a lot of people are like, oh, worried about the flavor. They're brewing it more like how we in the West brew our green tea, which is a little bit of leaf, a lot of water, long period of time. Ganastema, like most Chinese teas or most tea on the planet, actually should be brewed with a lot of leaf, usually in a little water. I'm going to do a big one here. And then for a shorter period of time, not like the 10, 15 minutes brew, even though you can get away with it if you use a lot of leaf. 
So there's a couple different ways you can brew and drink Ganestema. Um, I'll talk about a few. I'm going to show you first, once I get this boiling, how I kind of do it if I'm making up a big batch. So Ganestema as a tea base can be used for elixirs. Probably everyone here is familiar with elixir crafting, right, from the light cellar. Using a tea base, getting those elixirs. Um, kind of using that, again, over water, or you could mix it with a chaga tea. Always good together. It will foam a little bit, but when you add a fat, it'll kind of stop that process. I'm not going to blend any on high here. I'm going to show you kind of the old school way. So what I like to do is I'll usually take like a pot like this at home. So a smaller one. Obviously, we're using a big Dutch oven here today for this many people. And we're going to let this water come to a boil. Now, the nice thing about Ganestema is there's a huge range of flavor. You're still always going to extract saponins. If you wash the tea, so Ganestema likes to grow in sandy type soil, um, kind of arid soil, very similar to Camellia sinensis, the tea plant. So it is notorious for little stones and little bits of grit and stuff. So you can easily wash that. Just throw that in a strainer, right? under the sink, if you have filtered water, just bathe it a bit, take it out. You'll see right away, and this is one reason they don't wash it, the saponins, that foaming action will happen right away. Any sort of moisture gets on it. This Ganestema is grown kind of as a trade secret because it's such a fantastic variety. It's a nice sweet variety. Usually the sweet varieties out there have lower amounts of saponins. This stuff clocks in at about 8%, which is therapeutic levels. We'll talk about that. I think up here I have the um, grams, like a maintenance dose is like one to two teaspoons in a cup per day, let's say, up to about six grams per day. I like to take it, usually if I'm doing a batch this big, not, not even that big, like something, this is like my cup I drink at home, I brought it in today. Um, I'll drink it called grandpa style a lot of the times if I'm like studying or working, which means I'm going to drop some leaf in here and I'll use literally about this much, which is like a good two tablespoons and I'll hit that with hot water. It'll come to the top. I'll maybe lightly stir it a few times. Eventually that leaf is gonna float down to the bottom and that's what grandpa style drinking is. They're keeping it at the bottom, drinking about two thirds and then filling up with a third of water and continuously doing that. Now that flavor profile is gonna change a lot which is amazing to watch. Sometimes at the end it's gonna be sweeter than when you start and sometimes more bitter when you start and sweeter at the end. It's just kinda the magic of brewing tea. Like I said before though, you can do as little as 30 second brew. I should have brought in one of my uh, Gong Fu brewers to show you everyone, but basically you could hit it with 30 seconds of hot water, strain that, drink that, try that, see if you like that, playing with different, amount, different amounts of leaf. There's no upper limit, there's no lethal dose, it's like extremely high, very safe. It's all about getting that flavor right for you. I find in larger amounts, it's actually more sweet. In lesser amounts, it's actually more bitter. The sweet compounds come out when there's more leaf used. If you leave that tea, like say you take it out, um, you strain it, you go to reheat it, if you let it boil for like a long time by accident, the longer you let that boil, the, the less sweet it's gonna be. The sweet's gonna degrade over time. I don't know why that is. Um, and this isn't all the time. I've just found this if I have a thermos of it sometimes or it's really hot, I'll go to drink it and I can't believe how much the sweetness has come down. Again, another way, actually, and I'll maybe show you that in a bit. I'll boil this first, let everyone see. Hopefully now, everybody can see. Can you see that in the mirror at all? Everybody? Sort of. And I can move the table around gently when we can see that. So this is coming to a boil. I'm going to let it come up a little bit more. We should get it out now. You can measure it for sure. And I know I usually measure everything when I'm doing recipes for, for the public. This I'm just going to sprinkle on and mimic it to the size of my vessel. So I'm going to coat the top, not completely, but coat it, let it expand, and I'll kind of judge it from there. Same as what I would do with this little pot, obviously less. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of make sense to everyone? So we'll let it come up. That's probably good enough. I'm going to kill the heat. Exactly. And you can do the other way around. This is how I find you get the best taste out of it. Yeah, so I'm going to let it come down. Actually, I might switch this to a hot plate because that's a cast iron burner, so it holds the heat for a long time. <coughs> so let me shift this over because we all know shift happens. So, okay, put this down. I'm going to put this here. Okay, and then I can move it actually easier if you guys can see. Kind of see that? 
Okay, so we let the boil come down. Again, you could take it to a fisheye boil, like they call it, but I usually let it roar and then kind of bring it down. Now I'm going to put the gynostemma. Usually I use my hands at home, but I'm going to use just this bag. And we're going to see if we can get some foam action happening. Usually I'll do it a bit more than that. So that's hard to judge. That's probably about three, maybe four tablespoons for this. Now, I don't know if you can see that in the mirror, but you see the white... Yeah, sure I can. And I just want to be gentle to leave that foam on the top. Can everyone see that? Yeah. You see that foaming action? I'm going to grab a spoon here, see if I can play with it a bit. Those are the supponents. That's the magic of Gynostemma. So again, if you rinse it, so it's a trade-off between rinsing some dirt or sand off, which will fall to the bottom. You'll never drink it anyway. Just toss it. There will be a lot of broken up leaf too. You'll see sediment. But I know I've had found the odd stone. Um, and Chinese are big into washing their tea. With Ganostema though, it's like this stuff is all grown organically. Super strict process. Um, it's amazingly grown. I want to keep, personally, all the saponins intact. Right? I want that magic of Ganostema. Now you can see the real foam action coming. Can you guys kind of see that? And that's all that crazy good adaptogen medicine. So now if you strain that, we're going to let that sit, maybe brew for a little bit. Um, you know, again, you can judge on it, judge your own taste on it. I'll usually let that, actually, I'm going to put this on, show you something else. So when you say it can be brewed, it obviously depends on how long you let it brew first. For sure, yeah. And even if you, like, brew the stuff out of it <laughs> all everything you can usually um get some more flavor out of it usually you want to take it till it's about a clear liquid this amount of leaf though even if i let that sit like five minutes is usually kind of my max before i kind of start drinking from it um, i'll just add more water and kind of like keep that going like a big grandpa style but usually you can brew it a couple times just depends on your flavors too but you see look at that foam action Crazy. So if you put that in a jar and shake that, it'll foam quite a bit. So again, these are soap-like molecules, saponins, also steroidal-like molecules that are going to break up those fatty deposits and clean the body from the inside out, right? Super profound that way. So we're going to bring this water back up to boil. I'm going to switch gears and show you the next recipe while we let this brew. Does that make sense or is that okay with everyone? Oh, great question. Thank you for asking this. So a tea ball. So you can put it in a tea ball. I'll show you like a little strainer. Sometimes I'll do that. This is part of the magic of brewing it to make it taste sweet is actually letting it in, an, in a big wide container fully expand. Does that make sense? So tea balls will usually keep things really bound up. Even if you put a little bit of leaf, it's not enough in there to really get a nice sweet bitter going, going, uh, coming out of it. Excuse me. So I usually let it go in an open pot. Yeah, but whatever's convenient, honestly. It's uh, more important about getting it in, but this will better bang for your buck in terms of extraction. You're not going to let any s waste in there happen, but um, but that's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. So I'm going to pour this back in here because I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to bring that to the boil. So while that's boiling, I'm going to go show everybody another recipe here. So this is the second recipe, the Ganestema iced tea. Now I know it's cold out, and I usually always match like a warm uh, drink when it's cold out and vice versa. But this is just such an awesome way to drink Ganestema. So I like it cold, hot, any time of year. Um, even like we'll brew up a big batch, put it in jars, keep it in the fridge so we have it on hand. My partner and I, like she drinks it like all day long. Uh, me too. I will say too, the elimination, evacuation, if you're more prone to um, having looser bowels, this can definitely get you more loose if you drink a lot of it. So you want to use like common sense. If you know, hey, I'm going to the bathroom like a lot. Okay, just reduce it. It's not hurting you. It's cleaning out. It's like a gentle detoxify. That makes sense? It's just common sense with it. So we're going to take this off. So I'll usually brew this up, keep this in the fridge. This is, a, like I said, a cold recipe. You can do it room temperature. This was in the fridge, so it's still pretty cold. But basically, easy peasy. Let taste be your guide. We're going to take a blender there. We're going to put in like maybe like a liter. Um, actually, while I'm doing this, is Sasha here? Or Laura, do you want to help me? Sasha, can we get this tea? Maybe we should get it portioned out to keep on time. So I brought this one made up already. So we're going to get this going here. This is the Ganestema. Uh, so right there. Is that cool? Sorry, I should have given you some warning. 
So I'm gonna show you how I do this. Whoops, super easy. You're taking like a liter or whatever you want. You can make like a small cup of it. You'll see it foam just from pouring it in here. We're just gonna do a liter just for demonstration purposes. Now I'm gonna squeeze like two lemons, sometimes three, depends how you like it. What you're gonna be left with here is the craziest version of nest tea in a healthy way. This stuff tastes like store-bought nest tea, sort of. So we take this, we're gonna cut up some lemons. I'm gonna go with two, but again, that's the cold Ganestema. So I'd already brewed it, so it's Ganestema tea. Just brewed it up like last night type of thing. I hit myself. Um, brewed it up, put it in the jar, put it in the fridge overnight. So now it's ready to make this. Look at that. Super sharp knife here. <laughs> so we'll start with two, and then we can always taste it. So we're going to use the lemon squeezy here. Yeah, it's fine as long as it hits the fridge after like a few hours. Let's say or at the end of the day is usually what we'll do. Yeah, just because the heat will break down the stuff. Yeah, exactly that. And plus if the temperature's gone down, it's just kind of sitting open, it eventually will get like putrefied with bacteria. And trust me, if you don't believe me, just leave it out for a day. I guarantee you're going to forget one day and leave it in a pot. And it's going to be a little rank. <laughs> so just be cautious with that. Um, and it's again, because it's so nutritive. In the fridge, it lasts like a few weeks, no problem. Yeah, it stays pretty good because it is antimicrobial by nature, but it's also so nutritive that it will kind of go off. Ah, yeah, it's a good question. Well, uh, you could like I mean reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. Well, you. Add a lot of oh, for sure. Yeah, like I had lots at home. Yeah, I do that at home, but then you gotta usually rebrew. Like you'll hit like a saturation point. Uh, but when I make it at home, it's really saturated. I just want to see, are we way over time? What is I can't, yeah. So I'll just show you this quickly. They're going to taste that out. I'm going to talk about the next one. But basically, there's one seed in here. That's why I do in a bowl. So we're just going to put the lemon in. And then we're just going to put maple syrup into taste. I have some guidelines up there. But let taste be your guide, literally. So we're going to take some, okay. So we're going to put, I'm going to judge this, one, two, I'm going to put that much in, then I'm going to taste it. Yeah, so that's the iced tea. It's good, eh? <laughs> it's refreshing, it's sweet, it's, uh, <coughs> I'll be done in two minutes, is that okay? Yeah. So I put it in, then I'm just gonna use the blender to mix it up. So I put it on low, hopefully, and we're just gonna let it gently mix. You could just mix it in a jar with a spoon, but how is it? Good, yeah. Yeah, it tastes like, right? Like nest tea or like a good ice or sun tea. So this is the the Exactly, yeah, and that's all. Now, so that's what you're left with. So how easy is that, right? You can drink like liters of this question. You can cold brew, sorry, thank you. You can cold brew it uh, for sure. You're just gonna need to use less leaf because the extraction won't be as full. It definitely extracts the best in hot water. Um, but yeah, that's what the beauty of it. Just let kind of taste be your guide. I just know when I've cold brewed it, I don't get the full extraction. I can re literally reuse it. Um, a lot of people will use the Ganestema in salads, like the leaves after they brew them, if they're eating that night, or chewing on them. They're really like, I love chewing on the brewed leaves like this because they're kind of soft and sweet and yeah, it's really good stuff. So, so that's that one. There's one more thing I want to show quickly, quickly. I'm going to dump these out here. Can I just grab this bowl? So I'm just going to, you could do that. Yeah, usually if I'm going to use them in cooking, it's after I've brewed them and I have them there, then I'm going to throw them in stuff, if that makes sense. How is it? Yeah? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, I'll be quick here. So this is something I'm going to show you that Sasha is tasting downstairs. She reminded me that I used to always drink it this way, like like winters ago. 
and I actually forgot the ways and she put me back on track. So what we're going to do, we're going to use some, I'm just going to eyeball this, just put a glove on in case someone wants to try this. So you kind of get a mix of a tea flavor in Ganostema and then like almost like a sweet stevia type flavor. So if this will work, so usually I have like a deeper strainer at home that I do this, but actually maybe I'll bend this a tiny bit. We'll see if it'll work. So I'm going to bring, excuse me, that up to a boil. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the Ganostema leaves with something called bergamot. So it's an essential oil, comes from a citrus peel, um, super tasty. This is what they flavor Earl Grey tea with. So this is like an Earl Grey Ganostema and it's phenomenal. And I can't remember, use how many drops per... I think it's I one, do right? And I two, drops. two, yeah. And so I'm only going to do one for this. I yeah. I was thinking I used to do so just one. Three. Now, if you put this in after, so if I was to give you some of this tea and you were to put it in, uh, essential oils are hydrophobic, scared of water, so it's going to lay on the water for whatever the magic chemistry, because Ganostem is emulsifying. If it touches the Ganostema leaves first, the saponins will break it up, and you're going to get proper diffusion of that flavor through here. So sky's the limit on what you want to try. Lemon might be really good or vanilla or something like that. But I love Earl Grey, personally, that flavor. I just love it. So we're going to make that type of version. And then we might be out of... I did, yeah. So one drop right on those dry leaves. Yeah, so smells fantastic. We have smell vision here. Does anyone want to smell this? You want to take a, just take a whiff there? You can smell that it's got the oh, wow. bergamot. Yeah, this gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right? It's so comforting. So bergamot is actually an anti-stress herb. Really good to, uh, not I was going to say detoxify, but de-stress the digestive system before a meal. <coughs> so really good. Can be used after as well, but before a meal, it's going to open up that digestive system, let it relax, calm down. You're going to get proper digestive secretion by doing that. So I think we're pretty much over time. So we're going to maybe, I don't know how to do the hot tea. Uh, while I'm cleaning up, you can maybe help yourself to a little bit of it. I think we can maybe start a line. What's that, sorry? Oh, okay. So Sasha does have it downstairs though. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, would you mind? Yeah, and Sasha will have it for demo downstairs too, so if this lineup gets crazy long, you can uh, do that.